Well, thank you for convening this important event. Um, we greatly appreciate the strong collaboration with, with across the interagency, as well as uh, our private sector partners. According to the International Energy Agency, their own 2019 projections, by 2040, the Indo-Pacific's overall energy demand will grow 60% and require trillions of dollars of investment. How countries meet that growing demand will significantly impact energy security and economic stability across the region and have global ramifications. Huge shifts in supply and demand patterns amid energy system transformation will occur. In light of the scale of what is at issue, just over two years ago, Secretary Pompeo announced a U.S. Indo-Pacific economic strategy focused on the digital economy, infrastructure, and energy. Pursuant to that call, uh, Secretary launched Asia Edge, or Enhancing Development uh, and Growth Through Energy. Asia Edge seeks to ensure that this new energy map is built upon, built upon open, transparent markets and secure, reliable, and resilient supply chains. I'm proud to have a hand in leading Asia Edge, uh, but it's really a whole of government effort, including 10 different federal government agencies. Uh, the U.S. government works in partnership with countries to help them to achieve their respective energy security and development ambitions. What we do in government is to help create the right conditions. Uh, that's government's role here. It's, it's to make those, those countries attractive for private sector investment, because it is the private sector that is actually the implementers for this development track. Through EDGE, we work with governments to understand their ambition. What are the obstacles uh, to help create that, uh, those, those targets for investment so that they have favorable investment conditions? To do that, we've, we've already dedicated more than $140 million in technical assistance to support governments in advancing their energy security and diversification, access, and energy trade goals across the Indo-Pacific. Again, governments foster market development, but we are not the implementers. This is the purview of the private sector. I'm very pleased to see so many private sector U.S. firms leading this charge. They are, in fact, an extension of our soft diplomacy. To do that, and we've had an overwhelming response from the private sector. Uh, to date, Asia Edge has partnered with more, with more than 250 American private sector firms spanning across 39 U.S. states. Obviously, COVID has, has changed the way we all work. We're here doing this virtually. Uh, and the State Department is no, is no different. Thankfully, we benefit from having long-term, strong relationships with car partners across the region. We work in close collaboration with our 30 embassies across the Indo-Pacific region. And we build on our edge work across senior level annual government to government energy security dialogues with countries like Vietnam, Republic of Korea, Japan and Australia, among others. Our programs are based on the country's priorities, including power and gas market development and reform, renewable energy integration, energy efficiency, storage, finance, and digitization. For example, in countries like Vietnam and the Philippines, they have growing economies with incredible demands for energy. They'd like to import LNG and develop gas markets, but you just don't flip the switch. Uh, these are This is complex stuff. So we partner with governments to help them to develop open, transparent natural gas markets. This has led to significant deal flow in both countries. In fact, in the past year, the United States has advanced over $3 billion in U.S. commercial deals in these two countries alone. In India, the Modi administration has very ambitious renewable energy targets, yet they could do better on their utilization rates. Last year, FERC joined me in launching a new program called the Flexible Resources Initiative in New Delhi to support India's goals by integrating grid flexibility and looking at natural gas as a foundational option to achieve their broader renewable objectives. This will both improve reliability of India's grid and also create the signal to raise that private capital and, and catalyze more U.S. investment. Similarly, in South Asia, we're working with Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal to de develop a regional energy market and increase cross-border trade including with India. By working together as a regional market, we know that power systems will become more resilient and secure. 
as well as larger opportunities, scaled opportunities for investment. The United States is working in partnership with other like-minded countries to advance a shared vision of prosperous and a free Indo-Pacific region. This is especially in, in, in true in the case of our partnership with Japan, where we incorporated the Japan-US energy partnership into EDGE. Together, the United States and Japan can co-finance and co-develop projects in the region. Under the Japan-US Mekong Power Partnership, the State Department, USAID, with Japan are developing regional electricity grids and bolstering our support for U.S. firms working across to, to foster cross-border transmission. JUMP, as it's known, also promotes regional power trade, renewable energy integration, frameworks for distributed solar and battery energy storage systems, and power market reforms that would help attract more commercial investment. In closing, despite the challenges of COVID, we've seen our Asia Edge community adapt quickly with creative solutions. This has only been reinforced by my, my confidence that our work together can and will address the energy needs of the region and thereby enhance our collective security. Thank you so much. Well, thanks so much, uh, Frank. Uh, really appreciate it and always uh, good to see you even if, if only virtually. Um, we really appreciate and respect the, the wonderful partnership that we have with friends and colleagues at State. My name is Mitch Silk. I'm the Assistant Secretary for International Markets at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Um, I am so happy to be here today uh, with, with our private sector panelists. We've got a great group uh, to talk about the topic of supporting Indo-Pacific industry engagement and investment through our, our great and, and uh, impactful whole of government program called Asia Edge. Um, let me start out by welcoming everybody uh, virtually uh, to our lovely building, our historic building, uh, the Treasury Building at 15th and Pennsylvania. Um, I have a lovely view of, of the White House. It's a sunny day here in Washington, and uh, you will see behind me uh, an etching of Abe Lincoln, uh, which contains him, his cabinet, his four generals, and the Emancipation Proclamation. So on that little note of history, um, let me kick off the panel uh, with a couple of opening remarks. Um, what I'd like to do is to focus on, on three points, pretty simple points. Uh, point number one being value, point number two being growth, and point number three being private capital solutions. Those define the work in which we are engaged in energy and infrastructure under Asia Edge, and let me unpack each of those points really quickly. In terms of value, the key objective of our work under Asia Edge is to work with our partners in Asia. We have parallel programs in Latin America and in Africa, but we work with our government partners to assist them in unleashing value in their energy and infrastructure sectors. The way that we do that is we work hard at, on a partnership basis, helping our friends abroad identify investment opportunities that will result in good, healthy, impactful, and scaled growth. The way that we do that is we focus very much on the needs of the private capital markets, particularly the limited recourse project finance markets, and we work with governments on improving their enabling environments, um, sorting through barriers that they may have in uh, uh, attracting in private capital. In addition to that, we provide a ton of technical assistance, uh, and we'll hear a little bit about that today. Uh, the technical assistance is designed to address um, regularities and leveling playing fields in procurement, uh, improving creditworthiness and optimizing balance sheet state-owned utilities that are typically off-takers, uh, and most importantly, assisting with structuring. So uh, when we identify an opportunity, we work with our partners uh, in looking at how they might consider good structures that will lead to the good and healthy growth that we're after that will enable them to attract in more private capital. Um, we've got engagements going uh, under the banner of Asia Edge in seven jurisdictions 
the four developed markets of Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and Taiwan. Um, we've also got very robust um, engagements with Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia. We've got a couple others in the works. And in addition to that, um, we've got 13 engagements in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, I won't list all of the countries, but you can find them uh, on the state website. As we're focusing on private capital solutions, that necessarily involves the private sector. And we've got a great group of folks with us today, uh, friends, uh, some of whom are longtime friends and, and others colleagues, uh, representing uh, some of our best uh, and most impactful uh, energy companies. Um, we've got Anatole Fagan from Chenier. We've got Mark Green, an old friend from AES. Uh, we've got Daniel Bustos from Accelerate. And we're really pleased to have JC Sandberg from GE Renewable Energy. Um, before we get into the, the program and Q&A in the round, why don't I allow my friends and buddies to introduce themselves, uh, starting out with Anatole. Thank you. Uh, good day and uh, and welcome and thank you for having Shanir. I'm Anatole Fagan, uh, honored to represent the company as its uh, Chief Commercial Officer. Thank you to uh, Assistant Secretary Silk and Assistant Secretary Fannin for all that they do to promote commercial efforts and, and support our efforts abroad. Uh, Shanir is, uh, from an operational standpoint, uh, less than five years old. We uh, launched exports from the lower 48 of US LNG in February of 2016. Uh, today, we stand as the second largest operator of LNG facilities, second only to Qatar, and are proud to have exported over 1,200 cargoes to date from our two facilities at Sabine Pass, Louisiana and Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, lots of friends on this panel uh, along the energy value chain that we work very closely with. Our infrastructure would not be possible without uh, our friends at uh, General Electric. Our ability to serve now over 30 markets would not be possible without our friends at Accelerate. And, uh, and AES obviously has been developing these markets uh, and helping us create uh, the uh, infrastructure and the opportunities to provide affordable, reliable, and clean uh, energy to uh, various parts of the world with the Indo-Pacific region uh, being one of the key, not only markets to date with about a third of our volumes exported into the region, but also uh, an area that we are very optimistic on for decades and decades to come. We see that uh, since the US LNG market, uh, since US LNG came into the LNG market, we've had a profound effect on the liquidity transparency, commercial creativity that's available in that market. Um, one of the avenues and one of the areas where we work with our government partners and, and an enabling component is that, that creativity, that structuring, and the credit support that, uh, that uh, the U.S. government can provide. And that is something that uh, I'm sure is helpful to all of, uh, all of us on the panel. And with the with the recent experience, again, of US LNG entering the market and providing these additional tools, resources, and, uh, and bona fides to, uh, to the global gas supply chain, we're seeing a very dramatic effect play out in the Indo-Pacific region as countries continue to shift their energy uh, plans towards clean, affordable, and reliable natural gas, which uh, as Shanir, we're very honored to have the opportunity to supply into the market. So. With that, I'll turn it back to the panel and look forward to uh, the discussion on Q&A. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mitch, and uh, welcome to my colleagues. Um, it's a pleasure to see you all again here. Um, Indo-Pacific has been uh, obviously something that AS has been involved with, with some time or for some time. Um, we do significant amount of business out of Chile in addition to the U.S and pri prim primarily in Vietnam, which we're going to be speaking about here. But AS is a Fortune 500 global company um, based out of Arlington, Virginia. We provide affordable, sustainable energy in 14 different countries with a very diversified portfolio of thermal and renewable generation facilities. In
you know, long-term sustainable energy. So we look at our uh, renewable portfolio quite broad. We have 10 gigawatts of operating facilities um, and about 2.2 to 3 gigawatts of growth per year specific to renewables, which is Stellar as one of the leading companies across the globe. We have an energy uh, company called S Power out of the U.S. It's one of the leading solar uh, power projects or companies in addition to developing companies across the solar market across the U.S. We have an alliance with Google to provide sustainable, effectively clean, green energy to leverage their Google cloud uh, energy demands. And recently, we had the opportunity to sign an agreement with an Australian company, uh, innovative company called 5B. So we are now partnershiped in that, which effectively supplies uh, renewable projects the opportunity to uh, deliver more energy per square foot, in addition to build at a rate about two times faster than a typical solar project. Specific to Vietnam, We've got a large LNG infrastructure project that's ongoing as of today, in addition to a combined cycle plant that will continue to service the needs of Vietnam. We're developing that project with a partnership um, with PV Gas. We are currently in the development stage, but assume we will reach you know, full notice to proceed for construction in the near term, in addition to commercial operation. That project is a similar project to what we've done in the Domin Dominican Republic and in Panama. So AS is the leading LNG sector player for approximately 15 years of LNG production, um, procurement in addition to distribution within the Caribbean area. We are taking that same mindset, footprint, um, commercial strategy into Vietnam to continue to help even companies like Genere to utilize domestic uh, exports out of the US or imports into Vietnam to supply sustainable energy across the Vietnam region. The other opportunity that we see within Vietnam specifically is the utilization of our Fluence product. Fluence is a company that is owned by AES and Siemens. It supplies 2.1 gigawatts of operational uh, energy storage projects in 21 countries globally. We're looking to take that technology also into Vietnam to start procurement and production of our, our cube-based technology. So our Fluence cube-based technology will be um, produced in Vietnam. We wanna segue that throughout the Asia market as well. So we offer a lot of differential products within the market um, that we are looking to uh, obviously um, utilize to continue to drive down uh, the carbon utilization of energy, but effectively to drive up the deliverance and the reliability of renewable energy. So thank you very much, Mitch, and I'm glad to be here with you. Excellent, thanks so much, Mark. Always great to see you. Daniel uh, Bustos of Accelerate, you wanna take it away? Uh, thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Silk. A pleasure to be on the panel with AS, Chenier, G. What, what a great show of what the U.S. ingenuity can do on the energy market. Uh, we're, we're facing an era where our country can make a difference, not only on the environmental impact of what we do, but more importantly, I'm following some of your remarks on the way to do business internationally. And, and I think all the companies here, I, I, I'm very, very proud to know them for many, many years. We've crossed paths in many, many projects. We will keep collaborating on many, many different projects. And the standards of doing business that are used are second to none. And it's, it's something that is gonna be critical for the years to come. Accelerity has been on the market since 2005. And we have become the, the world leader on flooring LNG solutions. And this is something that has become more evident, particularly on the, on the last few years the need of connecting these large successful projects such as Senior with markets that are getting harder and harder to reach due to a combination of weather, location, uh, economics for the projects, regulation, etc. So when you see a company like Accelerate, we are leaders on the technology of what we do. We pioneer 
the flooding infrastructure, we pioneer offshore operations. We have performed more than 1,900 ship-to-ship -ship LNG transfers that have dramatically changed the way LNG import terminals are developed. But I strongly believe that the biggest contribution that we're making to the market is to become a local company on each country we go. We have presence in 13 different countries. We have 12 offices around the world. And that attitude towards the development, not as simply providing the technology, but actually providing the full service is actually changing the environment for some challenging markets that we're very proud to have open. Pakistan is a perfect example of that. At this moment, Pakistan, thanks to Accelerate and our local partners, uh, imports 20% of the or the local natural gas needs. Uh, it has helped uh, companies like GE develop state-of-the-art power generation in Pakistan that it would have been impossible without predictable gas natural, natural gas availability. Uh, it has helped over 500 industries have predictable access to natural gas, not only for heating, but fertilizing and added value of the garment industry. Uh, Bangladesh is another shining example of the Asia Pacific uh, area. We operate 100% of the LNG import uh, capacity on the country, up to 30% of the natural gas needs. And we do that in one of the most challenging environments with monsoon seasons that predictably will surely affect operations of all kinds of industries, and we keep uptimes and standards of operation that are similar to an onshore terminal operating under breakwater. But those are technical solutions. Those are not necessarily commercial solutions. The goal that we see for our company and for companies like AES too, they're a shining example of how to cope with the local complexity of the market, is to bring our business practices to these countries, is to not only show them how to do things, but actually to invest on the long tail of complexity that these markets represent. It's not only the LNG, these days LNG is abundant, it's flexible, it's liquid, it's not only the technological uh, needs uh, that you have for power generation or transportation. It's the way to do the business. Uh, and we believe that countries like Vietnam, for example, and the support that Vietnam is receiving from the U.S. are going to bring a material change on the environment and the way our companies lead towards a decarbonization. Good examples of that, and we expect to see the same in Vietnam. Bangladesh, till a few months ago, was the leading developer of coal-fired power generation. After the Bangladeshi government experienced firsthand how companies like Accelerate could provide predictable LNG supply to a country, the government has decided to abandon 90% of the projects, of the coal projects, and focus on gas fire, LNG to power, of course, and renewable energy. And by the way, congratulations to GE. You, just, you are very close to sign a very important agreement with the Bangladeshi uh, Power Development Corporation uh, for a very large LNG to power project. And these are the, the perfect examples how our industry can contribute to a dramatic increase on the energy security and to an improvement uh, on the environment. In Vietnam, in particular, uh, we know we have several colleagues that are going to be seen in person uh, in Hanoi, and we are actually actively participating on a couple of projects. As a, as a private company, we tend to be a little more low profile on the things that we do, but we expect to have some announcements in, in the short term. So thank you very much. Uh, just to, to finish with, I have a logo behind me that with the acronym SAIL, uh, we believe on, on doing business uh, with stewardship, accountability, improvement, and leadership. That's the way we like to see the market. Uh, we hope to keep contributing to the efforts of the U.S. government. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, 
Uh, Daniel, JC, over to you for a little bit about your background and uh, the great company of GE Renewable Energy. Well, thank you, Assistant Secretary Silk, Assistant Secretary Fannin, for the opportunity to participate. And a thank you as well to the partnership we've enjoyed with the companies participating in this roundtable today as a company. Um, I'm excited to talk about Asia Edge and, and our um, experience in the Indo-Pacific region specifically. As a company, uh, we have over 100 years of experience in the electricity space, uh, and we really are an all of the above energy company. But today, specifically, I'm here to talk about GE Renewable Energy and that um, we are an integrated renewable energy business across the renewable energy landscape. So wind, solar, storage, hydro, we have a very large global footprint and we're proud of the effort that we're making um, to bring the cutting edge technology to the market. Um, we're active in several global markets um, and we're working um, for policy frameworks and that's much of what our partnership has been with both Treasury and with the State Department is kind of setting up those um, policy frameworks where bankable projects can come to fruition and the, the industry can thrive. So, you know, COVID and, and the pandemic has introduced some certainty into energy markets. We've seen that. But the role of, of renewables and cleaner fuels are certainly here to stay. And we see that um, clearly across the energy landscape globally. I would say uh, more specifically to renewables, uh, very important that continued investment in the grid, both in developed and developing markets um, and Indo-Pacific region is no exception there, is key to the continuing aggressive deployment of renewable energy. More specific to the Indo-Pacific region, um, we view that as a very fast growing market for renewable deployment with a lot of promise. Um, but some of those markets do have unique characteristics and challenges. And I think we'll talk about some of those today. Um, specifically in Southeast Asia, we see um, in some of the larger economies, opportunities for wind and solar. I think there are in some of the smaller economies, uh, maximizing natural resources in the hydro space. And, and even to some extent, um, wind and solar uh, present unique opportunities. I think one of the things I hope we can talk about today, and the Assistant Secretary touched on it briefly, is the creditworthiness and bankability of, of our uh, counterparties as well as the bankability of the projects themselves and the power purchase agreements and so um, we have made a an investment in the region specifically in vietnam uh, for uh, some of our global supply chain we do most of our generator work globally in vietnam um, we continue to explore opportunities for us to expand in the region as the market grows and becomes more mature and so we look forward certainly and i personally look forward to the discussion today. And again, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thanks so much to all of you. Um, let's uh, get into the discussion. Um, so, you know, in the words of our forefathers, uh, the, the task is great and the day is short. There's so much to talk about in so very little time as with most things in life. Um, I think we're gonna try to um, get straight into it. And, and I'll ask the uh, panelists to, to be disciplined and and uh, maybe keep responses to a, a minute or two because I want to cover a little bit of ground and let me just throw a suggestion out there um, for the four of you. I thought that um, the best way that we could get at the issues for all of the folks that are with us today would be to divide into macro and micro. Um, maybe we'll start with one question on the on the macro as a scene setter uh, relating to you know generally let's say the biggest challenge that you might see in uh, Asia Pacific in the Indo-Pac market um, and whether you have um, had the opportunity um, to work with any of our agencies in dealing with uh, say one of your key challenges. From there, uh, I'd like to uh, jump into a couple of micro or sector specific topics uh, running, uh, let's say, all the way through up, up and down the energy value chain, maybe starting a little bit with uh, uh, a question or two to Anatole and Daniel about upstream, uh, and then we'll we'll do a little bit of uh, downstream and and in the in the middle midstream and and bridging, and then wrap up with maybe a, a look into the future. So uh, to kick off in reverse order, JC, you'd started talking a little bit about a few of your challenges in your introductory mark, maybe give us one big challenge that you see your, you know, your wish list and, and maybe elaborate a little bit further uh, on how you've interacted with us so folks can have an idea 
of what we at the USG might be able to do to help out. Well, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to lead mm -hmm. off here. I would say um, two broad buckets. One would be the creditworthiness, uh, as you raised, or the bankability of power purchase agreements. And I think um, across the region, um, but specifically in some of the bigger markets, we've seen that as an issue that has delayed projects. And so um, we've worked extensively um, with the State Department uh, and to push that forward. And I think we are seeing some fruits. Um, they've been slow to develop, um, but I think we are we are certainly seeing projects progress. Excuse me. The I'm thinking projects as well because I think one of the other things that um, does trip us up in the region sometimes is turnkey projects and the um, acquisition, the permitting to to commissioning, and we have. Um, reached out to you and look forward to the role that Asia Edge can continue to play as a whole of government approach to making the these markets kind of function a little bit better from a project development and execution standpoint. Excellent. Thanks so much, Daniel. Big challenge to you guys and and whether you have you've had the opportunity to call on uh, any of us within our 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 interagency team and if so how. Well, yes, and we have we have had the chance to to interact with the interagency inter team, and we actually had a, a very good uh, call last week uh, with the chief development officer of DFC. Uh, uh, there are material changes that the U.S. government is bringing in terms of support to the companies, and that is critical because uh, one of the main challenges that we face. It's just leveling the play field. Uh, when we go to these countries, uh, we not only face the issues that JC was well mentioning, but we tend to compete with governments, not with other companies. Uh, it, when you see the, the, the coal generation industrial complex that brings uh, everything from the EPC to the financing, uh, in some countries even to the laws, affecting the loss in the countries, uh, uh, practices that uh, several times, not only we cannot follow, but we don't want to follow in terms of lending practices, is a critical challenge. And in that sense, uh, you, the U.S. government always uh, will lead towards private investment, fairness of treatment, but definitely the support that the U.S. can bring to help the champions of energy that have been developing projects for decades to actually have a better access to fair conditions uh, is, is one of the most critical aspects. And once you've done that, the results are, are pretty dramatic in that sense. We saw the support that we received from the U.S. government in Pakistan. Pakistan had been trying to put projects together for 13 years. And finally, the, the coalition of private companies with the government helped put that project across the line, help the project for being project finance uh, eventually, uh, and it's an example of what it can be done. So I agree with JC, the bankability of PPS is a critical issue, but there's a sheer competition aspect that we need uh, the U.S. government as an ally to correct. Thanks, Daniel. Let me just unpack uh, a couple of points that, that both JC and Daniel have made about uh, the work that we do on the interagency that's relevant to your points. Um, the, the key point that I wanted to make on the creditworthiness side of things is that um, our Treasury Office of Technical Assistance, alongside of other agencies, is working very hard with our partners in Asia Edge and other partners throughout the world to optimize the balance sheets. Um, of their state-owned utilities. Um, we do that through a couple of means. We help them uh, consolidate and, and expand out uh, their debt, um, try to help them lower their prices of uh, cost of capital um, and work with them on their credit ratings. All of that work we've seen has been extraordinarily impactful. We, we, we scored a big win with the Panama utility uh, a while back on this front uh, in, in realizing, uh, uh, helping them realize a large 30-year takeout financing, which reduced significantly uh, their cost of capital. Um, uh, Daniel, you mentioned DFC. 
Um, I encourage folks uh, that are viewing to look them up uh, on their website. That's our new International Development Finance Corp uh, that comes to the table with expanded authorities and an expanded balance sheet. And finally, in terms of leveling the playing field, with both, which both of you spoke about, we've got some very active engagements on the procurement front to ensure that we're, we're helping our partner governments get rid of some of the goals that you mentioned that confront you and to assist in leveling the playing field in respect of um, what I think Daniel was referring to uh, in the, the uh, approaches of some bad actors uh, in, the, you know, in the space. I'd like to jump from that uh, into our discussion on energy value chain. Let's start, let's start right at the, at the tip, which is upstream. Anatole, you spoke a little bit about uh, the emergence of U.S. as an energy exporter and some of the successes that you've realized. Tell us about how the scene has changed so much and how Asia fits into that. After that, I want to call on Mark Green to talk a little bit about the importance of downstream development uh, in, in being able to catalyze upstream demand. So tell us about a couple of your successes, Anatole, and, and unpack a little bit of, of these uh, exciting developments for our group. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, it's a pleasure to, again, rep represent the U.S. industry here uh, on the LNG side. Um, Ten years ago, uh, our founder had this heretical idea that uh, uh, North American gas production was going to be so affordable that it would actually be able to economically reach the world and uh, and have the impacts that um, prophetically we are we are enjoying today. Um, interestingly, along that path, um, uh, creative destruction and uh, and innovation has continued to drive down the economics for our upstream friends. Uh, it is a massively distributed industry with uh, literally thousands of participants, all of whom are are competing to be the low cost producer. And that has uh, has enabled the world to enjoy the economics and relative cleanliness of, of North American gas production. When we signed our initial export contracts in the uh, fall of 2011, uh, the forward curve for natural gas had um, eight eight dollar nine dollar kind of forward prices. Today, uh, there is no uh, other than 2021. There is no forward year that is above three dollars until well into the 2030s. As a result of all of this in innovation, which of course the uh, the consumers have benefited from tremendously. The liquefaction industry uh, in the U.S., especially in the U.S. Gulf Coast, has responded as well with, with continuing to innovate, bring down costs, bring up efficiencies. And the business model that is wrapped around that that allows these cargos to move to the markets that, that need them and, uh, and do so reliably and effectively has really, in the last five years, transformed the LNG market into, into a market, into something that is liquid, into something that can offer the type of commercial creativity that all of my fellow panelists um, uh, continue to, to build on and, and utilize. That said, even with the excellent efforts of, uh, of uh, Accelerate and, and other companies to, in some sense, democratize and reduce the minimum efficiency scale of this business and allow uh, LNG to, to reach these, uh, these various markets, uh, importing markets today are over 40 um, separate markets with another nine that have facilities that are under construction. So we'll be, we'll be at 50 countries that are capable of importing LNG by 2024. We stand at the ready to support all of those. Uh, US upstream is, uh, is responsive to those price signals and the US upstream community largely realizes that the hand that it's dealt as most OECD uh, domestic energy consumption is unlikely to increase so everyone now has an eye towards the export market. And in fact, we've entered into some transactions with U.S. producers that get paid based on the economics of, of uh, natural gas prices globally. So things are evolving very rapidly and uh, we, we are ready to support continued commercial innovation. And uh, I would just echo the comments that, uh, that you heard from the other panelists of, since it's non-OECD that's driving demand, especially in Asia, Credit is important. Uh, transparency and uh, and a level playing field are absolutely critical. 
and uh, and really industry will do the rest. We just uh, need the excellent efforts of Asia Edge and uh, and the uh, multilateral lenders uh, to to support the credit formation that is critical at this early juncture. So Anatole, and, and thank you for that. In your words, the liquefied natural gas market is liquid. Pardon the pun. Yeah. Indeed. Perfect. <laughs> so those were your words, not mine. Uh, Anatole, uh, long-term SPAs uh, are critical to your business uh, for sure. It sounds like you're 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 actively booking. Um, so the 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 SPAs are are fueling again. Pardon the pun. The, the upstream supply side, in turn, you know, no man is an island. Um, those SPAs require downstream demand, right? Mark, Absolutely. Mark, let's turn over to you. Uh, AES, so extraordinarily successful uh, in the IPP field, one of the few uh, folks still standing. Um, tell us a little bit about um, successes on the downstream uh, in Asia Pacific. <clears throat> Thanks, Mitch. Um, and a good question. I think a good seg segue on the liquidity is, um, as we discuss some of the complexities between the tenant, right? So the anchor tenant is the security of that liquidity, which is what you were touching on effectively for us, the combined cycle power plant. So while my other colleagues touched on the contractual integrity, which is highly critical for these very complex, large capital intensive projects, um, that PPA and the, the credit worthiness of that PPA rolling through the gas or gas supply agreement or fuel supply agreement to the LNG terminal from the LNG terminal through the procurement of the, the LNG or the fuel supply agreement on that side, the flow through of those risks or credit worthiness are highly critical to the success of that export out of the U.S. to the import into these said countries. And we're experiencing that now. Um, and so to touch on that, um, you know, when you're working with governmental partners and we have a very stellar success of partnerships, you know, business interactions, productivity and stakeholder responses, shareholder responses, all the way through that chain on our side, the government that you partner with us in Vietnam, the Vietnamese government through Petro Vietnam is highly critical to that success. And we see that alliance, that opportunity of alliance to ensure that those contractual flow throughs happen correctly to make the projects happen on time. So the other critical factor is a time factor because you're not dealing with one asset to secure that liquidity. You're dealing with several and that time span could be significantly reduced with greater efficiency on the partnership side. And that's what we're seeking. Um, and to comment on one last point, um, your agency has been of great success to AES on a global basis, but specific to the, you know, Asia, um, you know, or specific to Vietnam, the DFC, in addition to now uh, USXM, have stepped up tremendously to support AES in their projects, their said projects of development, and that all comes through the work and dedication from you and your team. So thank you very much. Well, Mark, that's so kind of you. I'd like to say that we, we pay you a lot um, to say stuff like that, but we all know that we don't do that and we can't do that. But we do thank you for the sentiment uh, and to echo and maybe expand yet again, you know, DFC, uh, expanded authorities, expanded balance sheet. Exim is back in business, uh, reauthorized. They got up, they've been raring to go. Uh, and I encourage all of you uh, that are viewing to to reach out to contacts at Exim uh, if you do have trade finance needs. Mark, I want to use that uh, that grounding downstream point to segue over to JC and talk about a a different dimension of the downstream, uh, which is renewables. And uh, two points strike me as interesting to chat about. Number one, if you look at every country in Asia Pacific. They've all got extraordinarily ambitious renewables goals, 2030, 2050, 50% 50 of the mix, 80% of the mix, 100% of the risk. Is it realistic? What do you see happening? And finally, speak to us a little bit about bridging, the importance of bridging and the importance of ensuring 
that our government friends and partners in Asia Pacific have the supporting transmission and interconnection to realize their ambitions in the, re in the renewable space? Thank you for the question. I think um, it, it's uh, tread carefully here. I think there is certainly a real commitment in the, in the region. Um, I think some markets are probably further along than others, but there are real market issues that remain. But I think as a whole, um, as you laid out, there's a real commitment to work through those issues. Um, and I think we're optimistic um, that if, as they continue to work through those issues, that there's a real promising market there. Now, will they meet these ambitious targets? You know, I think, um, I think there's certainly um, the intent to get there. Uh, you know, what, let's see what the next three, five years bring. I think um, transmission investment is a real key component there, uh, as well as um, continuing to do the types of things, um, you know, whether it's investing in, in, in gas and other kinds of necessary baseload to be able to deploy more renewables. I think those are all pieces and parts of an equation that is working itself out in real time. And then you, we overlay that with, um, as you know, uh, this push by many um, manufacturers with their own carbon neutrality targets and things to be able to procure renewables. And it, specifically in Vietnam, I think one of the, where we've really leaned on um, the U.S. government and where they've been a big help is in kind of formulating and, and pushing through in Vietnam um, the direct, the regulations around direct PPAs. And I think that we were hopeful that would I think it's maybe slipped a little to the right, but I think that has been for us a, a, on the renewable side, an example of where the U.S. government engagement has borne real um, fruit in pushing the ball down the road. Great. So what I take out of that are, are two things, uh, space and balance. Space referring to the fact, I think, that there really is room for everybody. Uh, not limited to to one form of generation or fuel or another or one form of technology or another and linked to that but separate uh, my view and our view is that ambitious plans are are great um, aspirational but what each of the markets really require is is realizing the delicate balance uh, and being realistic about that balance in setting up their energy mix by fuel and by technology. Uh, gents, we've got about five minutes left. Uh, let's, let's take a, a quick gaze through our crystal ball uh, and give each of you about one minute uh, to talk about um, what, what excites you uh, in the coming year, what gets you out of bed, what, what are you uh, eyed uh, and focused on in realizing over the coming year, and uh, maybe we'll we'll kick off with uh, with Anatole. Thank you, Mitch. Um, excited about getting 2020 behind us. Um, it's uh, certainly been an incredibly challenging year, and uh, you know, started off with uh, a challenging backdrop in the energy market. Um, fourth year of dramatic supply additions in the LNG market, um, and. Uh, and of course, uh, COVID nineteen. On top of that, we've uh, the industry overall has uh, has gotten through it uh, with with um, much better uh, colors, much better outcome than than I would have guessed if someone would have told me that. In fact, uh, I think as of today, the IEA uh, is forecasting only a three percent contraction for the natural gas market growth for the LNG market, um, and uh, we think that we've really proved our mettle through this environment. And uh, in the decades to come, exactly as you said, the um, different solutions and the attractiveness of different products for different markets paints a very good picture, especially in Asia and Indo-Pacific for our products and, and uh, our future uh, ability to, to supply those. So very excited to have uh, gotten this, this period um, largely behind us. And looking forward to uh, to a great next couple of decades as we continue to grow and continue to support the 
economic and energy ambitions of, uh, of the world with a focus on Asia. Excellent. Thanks so much, Anato. We're getting really short on time. JC, 30 seconds worth of a, a gaze down your crystal ball. Uh, COVID in the rearview mirror, I agree with Anatole. And then just continued growth in global markets of uh, renewables. And we look forward to a partnership with you as we do that. Thank you. Mark? Yeah, for us, um, pretty much the same. It, um, but we want to see a massive carbon reduction. Um, I want to live to see the new greener day, both in uh, carbon reduction, renewable implementation, in addition to uh, profitability across the region. So that's it for us. And Daniel, over to you, 30 seconds worth. I think 2021 is the year where a combination of smart, flexible LNG to power and renewables puts an end on the story of coal fire generation in Asia Pacific. It's gonna be a dramatic year and yes, I could speak for hours about that, but I would like to leave it there. Thank you. The year that well, we defeat carbon. Thank you so much, gentlemen. You've been really extraordinary. We're, we're just uh, in the 30 second countdown. Let me thank you all for being with us today. Let me thank uh, our great hosts and my great friends and partners on the interagency. Um, and uh, I'm hearing a in uh, against not easy and rather challenging times, uh, I'm hearing a tremendous amount of optimism and I'm really uh, delighted to hear that. And I look forward to focusing with all of you uh, on our three goals at the interagency within the US government of unleashing value, achieving good, healthy, impactful and scaled growth and pushing for those private capital solutions. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.